just over 10 years ago now, the Institute for the Future, a think tank based out of Palo Alto up in the Bay Area, completed a project for the Consortium of Endowed Episcopal Parishes, an association of nearly 200 Episcopal churches all across the country who share in common the fact that they all have a church endowment of at least a million dollars. In fact, for a number of years, Church of Our Savior was a member of that consortium. The results of that collaborative project between the Institute and the consortium were summarized in this lovely little fold-out brochure here that opens way out, entitled 2008 to 2018, Map of Future Forces Affecting the Episcopal Church. The Institute for the Future, as their name suggests, tries to look down the road and just over the horizon so that the groups that they work with can plan for tomorrow and beyond rather than simply living for today based on yesterday's experiences. Well, in their report, the Institute for the Future identified 15 of what they called provocations. Not predictions about the future, but rather trends which could provoke the church into action. Looking at that list of trends in 2019, which they identified over a decade ago now, which could impact both the church and the world, is now kind of a duh experience. As in, duh, of course all that stuff makes sense. After the fact, it all seems so boringly self-evident. But knowing that this list was compiled over 10 years ago now, when the world looked very different, one can see that these provocations were quite provocative and profound for their insight into what the world was becoming. Well, a few of those provocations are built around themes using the language of the Institute for the Future, like extreme climate variability. The term global warming hadn't yet become a buzzword in the early 2000s. But in the estimation of the Institute, it was undeniable how our planet was changing, with major implications not only for society, but for the church as well. Another theme which the Institute identified was what they called smart networking, the explosion of social media. For example, who would have imagined 10 years ago that a person would announce their candidacy for President of the United States on their Facebook page? Or that the current President would use his Twitter account to roll out major new initiatives or policies? But that is indeed the world that we live in today. But one of those 15 provocations, which seems to have almost overwhelmed the world in 2019, is what the Institute for the Future called polarizing extremes. Where way back then they anticipated that discussion of any issue of importance would be hijacked by voices on the extreme ends of the spectrum. A world where all of us are compelled to adopt one of two positions, with little toleration for all of the voices somewhere in the middle. Ten years ago, who would have imagined that the 24-hour cable news choices would boil down to Fox News on one end of a story and CNN on the polar opposite? And so, every issue of importance today whether it is a response to gun violence at a manufacturing plant in Illinois, 
or building a wall along our southern border, or Amazon withdrawing plans to build a major facility in New York City, or whether football players should be allowed to kneel during the national anthem. Every issue of importance is boiled down to a binary either or you're for us or you're against us dichotomy. It is in that world of polarizing extremes that today's scriptures are encountered. Read through this either-or worldview, this morning's lessons seem to be written not only to today's listening audience, but in fact by today's audience as well. For read in one way, they seem to pander to the worst instincts of our common cultural values today, of dividing the world into two opposing camps. Our first lesson this morning, we heard the words of Jeremiah. Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength. And blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. Are you cursed or are you blessed? And then the psalmist went on to proclaim, Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked. Everything they do shall prosper. But it is not so with the wicked. They are like the chaff which the wind blows away. The way of the wicked is doomed. Happy or doomed. And then it all comes to its stunning conclusion in the gospel reading from Luke. As Jesus proclaims what have come to be known as the Beatitudes in short and unequivocal terms. Unlike Matthew's version of those same Beatitudes, which frames them in a much more spiritual and general and universal language. Luke's Jesus cuts right to the chase. Blessed are you who are poor, woe to you who are rich, period. Blessed are you who are hungry, woe to you who are filled, period. Blessed are you who weep, woe to you who are laughing, period. Blessed are, are you when people hate you, woe to you when all speak well of you, period. End of story. That's one way to read that story. And I'm sure that there are countless polarized and polarizing preachers across the country this morning who are just licking their chops at the prospect of climbing up onto their soapboxes and fanning their own flames of further polarization using today's lessons as their launching pad. Some of them might even, either privately in their own minds or publicly in their sermons, express a sentiment that lots of my fundamentalist friends have used over the years when discussing their stance toward the scriptures. Simply put, it goes like this. The Bible said it. I believe it. That settles it. If only... Life was so simple. But it's not. The biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann speaks of the Holy Scriptures as being endlessly subversive of the way we want the world to be. Today's Gospel is a great example of that subversiveness. After all, what is so blessed, after all, about being poor, or hungry, or sorrowful, or hated? And for that matter, what is so woeful about being rich, or well-fed, happy, or well-thought-of? Taken at face value, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And so we ask ourselves, did Jesus really mean it when he used such harsh and 
apparently nonsensical language as we heard in this morning's gospel lesson? Well, I must say to you, I really think he did. But not for the reasons that most of us think. You see, I don't think that Jesus' words are meant to be used as a yardstick for us to measure ourselves against one another and thereby divide everybody into one of two camps. You know how that kind of an argument unfolds. It goes something like this. You are rich, I am poor, therefore I'm a better person than you are. Or, people like you and they hate me, so God must love me more than God loves you. That, quite frankly, is the shallow interpretation of this morning's gospel lesson. It is the easy way out. And God, it seems, rarely invites us down the easy path. Because, you see, I would suspect that for each one of us in the room here this morning, you know somebody who has a lot more money than you do. And you know somebody who has a lot less money than you do. There is someone who has a fuller belly and someone whose belly is emptier. There is someone you know who is happier than you are and someone who is more grief-stricken. There is someone who has a better relationship and reputation in the community and someone who is less respected than you are. None of us are those extreme cases. All of us are in-betweeners, finding ourselves somewhere in the middle. Rather, I think that today's gospel invites us into a different kind of conversation. Not one in which we compare ourselves to one another, but rather an internal conversation where we assess who we are and who we might become in the eyes of God. It's not our relationship with one another that's being described in Jesus' words today. It's about our relationship with God. What is, what is the biggest difference between those who are rich or full or laughing or respected and those who are poor or hungry or weeping or hated? Well, I think that the temptation for that first group is to think that what they have is enough. The tendency to succumb to the futility of thinking that the way the world is right now is good enough. And so they grow content with the what is. That, that second group, however, recognizes their own frailty, their own limitations, their own brokenness, and so they can still long for what might be. The subversive nature of Jesus' message is that if your wealth or your full belly or your laughing or your good reputation become a crutch for you to lean on instead of putting your full trust in a loving God, then woe to you. If those things become an obstacle which prevent you from experiencing the graciousness of God in all its fullness then however good you think you've got it, you're still missing out on something more. So, wherever you find yourself in your own life right at this moment, today's gospel is the assurance that there is an even better life for those who can imagine it. That if we can step away from those walls of expectation we have built around ourselves about how the world is supposed to be, then God has a vision for us of how the world might be. How in God's 
vision the world really is. That a new day is dawning for those who have the courage to lift up the shades blocking those first rays of the morning sun. Might that be a little unsettling for some of us? You bet it is. But we know that we don't enter into that new day alone. For God is there beckoning us to step out of the shadows and to step into the light where God will say to each one of us, Blessed. Blessed are you. Amen.